Well, good morning, everybody. How are you? I heard somebody say, man, it's cold in here. <laughs> We're about to warm you up from the inside and on the outside, right? We are so glad that you guys are here. We're glad that you guys are watching online. Uh, you might notice that we seem to be missing some people. That's because right now we're doing family camp, and there's about 70 people over in the DeLand area at a camp, and I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. But we're glad that you guys are here in the building, and like I said, watching online. Hey, if you're watching online, you could do us a huge favor. Just in the comments section of wherever you're watching, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, or Rumble, just... Maybe give us your first name, maybe where you're watching from, maybe how many people are watching. We'd love to just know kind of uh, how we're reaching people out onto the internet. And for those of you that are here, if you're here for the very first time, we would love it if you would just consider taking a moment and giving us a little bit of information on this connection card. And then after the service today, if you take it to the welcome tent and uh, give it to the individual out there, they'll give you a gift for being here today. I did see some new people coming in. And let me tell you something, I'm really, really glad that you're here today. We love having new people at the church. And uh, I'm confident that you'll feel welcomed in this place. We've got some wonderful people here at the church. Well, before we get started with some worship, would you stand with me and let's pray and ask God to just oversee this Sunday morning service and to be a part of, uh, of or to be a part of, of all of it and uh, to really speak to us uh, in a new way. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for a beautiful Sunday morning. We recognize that every gift, every good gift comes from you and that you love to give your children good gifts and we're grateful for that. Lord, I ask now just a, a prayer of blessing. Number one, on all of our families and uh, people that are at the camp right now. I know right now they're starting their worship service, Fireside. And we know that there are going to be some people baptized today. And we're excited and enthused about those life uh, transformations that are happening. And I pray for this group here that's in this building that, Lord, you would initiate the same kind of life transformation here, uh, that for the people that are new, you would welcome them in with your Holy Spirit. And I pray for the people that are watching online, whether they're watching live or maybe watching weeks or months later, that you would use this service um, to comfort and to heal and ultimately to be glorified because Lord, you are worth it. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our admiration. And we just dedicate this time to you and your glory. And all God's children said, amen. Amen. How are we feeling this morning? Good. Who's ready to be in the house of the Lord? Lift your hands. My name's Aaliyah, and I'm the worship leader, and I just love Jesus. I love to... This is allow you guys to experience the presence of God through music and through worship. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. And um, before I became an official worship leader, this is how I led to people. Just me and the guitar. So this is something I love to do. Um, it's something I grew up doing. It's how I learned how to sing. I learned how to play guitar just by connecting with people through this way. I usually have a full band with me. But this morning as we have family camp, it's just going to be me this morning. So I need you guys to sing really Really, really loud. Does that sound good? How many of you guys know that the battle and all of our battles belong to Jesus? If you know that, would you lift your hands? Jesus is our author, our perfecter. He never changes. Our life is constantly changing. But who never changes? Jesus. The battle belongs to Jesus. Amen. Say amen if you believe that this morning. Let's sing. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain moved. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. Nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. We're safe with Jesus. You sing, 
So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. Come on, with my lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs. Every fear and every fear I lay at your feet. Yeah. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to oh, yeah, the battle belongs to Jesus. And if you are for me, yeah, you can be against me. For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. And when all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Thank you, Jesus. And when all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I find it, my soul.
silence of sin and grave. The heavens, the, the praise for you. If I join you in your suffering, then I'll join you. 
Good morning. Isn't Christ wonderful? Isn't he powerful? That's why we gather together to worship him. I'm Bob Johnson. I'm a partner here at LifePoint. It's my privilege to get to worship with you together this morning, our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. We come to a point in time where we get to worship our Lord and Savior, our God, Jesus, through communion, where we remember his death and the new covenant that he makes on our behalf. And we proclaim this till he returns. If you are a part of this family, you are a part of this family. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and if you are watching online, I'd like to invite you now to go to your kitchen or cupboard and get your own elements, bread, crackers, juice, water, and participate with us as we worship. Communion, where we remember the death of Jesus Christ. How many of you guys are familiar with Legos? Yeah? Yeah, if you step on one at three o'clock in the morning, you will be. <laughs> Legos are great things. You can build planes with them, trains with them, automobiles, even Death Stars. The thing about, thing about Legos are they're made to be connected to other Legos. And a Lego not connected to anything cannot fulfill its ultimate purpose. And as Christians, we come together to fulfill our purpose of worshiping Jesus Christ. God has his own purpose for each of our individual lives. And we find that through Jesus Christ and through his church. For Jesus tells us in the Bible that he came, that he would build his church upon this rock. My asthma is acting up, so please bear with me. So, the Bible tells us that if we're in Christ, we're a part of God's family according to Ephesians chapter 2. And if you want to fulfill your purpose in life, if you want to have meaning and hope, it's only through Jesus Christ as we remember that. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for this time, this opportunity to worship you. To remember the sacrifice that Jesus did for our, our sins, and the sacrifice that he made, that we may have new life. As we take this communion, let us be reminded of the sacrifice that was made. Help us to be reminded of our purpose in you, and that fulfillment through your body and through your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you will stand at this time, use the outer, use the outer rolls to come up to the front to gather your elements and return to your seats.
bread represents the body of Christ, sacrificed and broken on our behalf. Take and eat. This cup is symbolic of the covenant that he made with us, the new covenant, take and drink. And we proclaim these things as Jesus comes back. Good morning. Good morning. My name is James Gromlick. I am one of the elders here, and it's my uh, privilege to talk to you about the offering. Um, so how many of y'all remember back a couple of years ago uh, when the lottery was like a bajillion, gajillion dollars? And, and uh, so I had this group at work, um, and, you know, they would regularly buy lottery tickets, and I wouldn't just because the odds are so bad. Um, your odds are much better at losing than at winning. Uh, which is where all the money comes from. But, you know, it was almost like, what if? You know, what if? Maybe we could win the billion dollars and split it, you know, six ways. And I, I was like, Lord, if, if, I, if I won that money, just think of all the good I could do for you. I, w I seriously prayed that prayer. And about 30 seconds later, I thought, what a moron I am. I started laughing at myself. I was like... I got a good chuckle because God was like, it's all mine anyway. And you're rich. He goes, you are already rich. We live in one of the richest countries, if not the richest country in the world. So me telling him I would do good things for him. I would give back to him a little bit of, of whatever he decides to bless me with. If only I had more. Is, is kind of like the stupidest prayer you could pray. Um, and so, so I, you know, I got a good chuckle out of that. And I still get a good chuckle out of that because uh, the Bible tells us the earth is the Lord's and are the fullness therein. That means the world and all the people. So, so all of the stuff that, that we think is ours is not ours. It's given to us for a purpose. And so, um, I lost my spot. So... <laughs> My, my relationship with money says a lot about my relationship with God. Just like my relationship with my wife says a lot about my relationship with God. So I want us to think about that. I'm not trying to guilt you into giving. It, it's not like, oh, you know, if you're not, if you're not giving, you're not right. Um, but you should give prayerfully. You should prayerfully think about what it is that God would have you give back to his church for his purpose, because it's his anyway. So, so the idea of when I just have enough, then you know what, then I'll start tithing. If, if I just, you know, I, if, I'm, if I'm good for me, then I'll start, you know, giving. That's not how it works. You should pray about it and figure out from your heart what God wants you to give. It's not about the amount at LifePoint. We like to say it's not about the amount. It, it's just the, that you consider what God would have you give to his kingdom. So there's three ways to give here. You can give online. You can give at the black boxes in the back or in the, uh, by the doors as you leave. Or you can give by texting 84321. You can text any amount. Now, it has to be the amount that you want to give. It's not like, you know, I want to give a million dollars. You know, text whatever it is that you prayerfully consider giving to 84321. Um, and that's how we take offerings here. So there's one other thing. How many of y'all got a weekly when you came in? That's the, what we used to call bulletins. So, so there's a piece of paper in there. And we announced a couple weeks ago that Phil was celebrating his 20th anniversary. And here, here at LifePoint. I mean, he's been married to his wife much longer than that. But his 20th anniversary here at LifePoint, he started off as the worship leader, um, and then he became the, yes, go, Leah. So he became the main, he became the main pastor here, the lead pastor, teaching pastor. Um, and we want to celebrate that. Uh, it came up around Easter. We didn't want to get it lost in the mix. Uh, we also wanted to give you guys enough time to prayerfully consider what it was that you would, how you would participate. And so um, what we've done is there's some cards in the back. Um, where the communion normally is. And you can uh, take one of those cards and write him a note. That's one way. Uh, the other way is you can, you can give. 
Um, we talked about texting to 84321. If you text any amount along with the words fill 20 to 84321, that will make a contribution towards a gift that we are gathering up for him over the next several weeks. And then after we, after we settle that out on the 7th, um, we will, the, the week after that, um, they're not here, so the week after that, we will, we will come together as a church and celebrate him uh, and give him a gift. Um, we also ask that you would pray for him and his family and their ministry, and that you would give him words of encouragement. So check out this flyer. It's in the weekly. If you didn't get one, grab one on the way out and grab one of those cards from the back. So let's pray for the offering. Lord, we thank you for the many gifts that you give us. And we pray that we will use them wisely towards your purpose, whether that be our hands, our minds, or the money that you bless us with, or the talents that you have given us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Turning your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible this morning, you should see some around underneath the chair around you. Galatians chapter 5. Please turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there are some Bibles around you. If you're using an electronic version of the Bible, we'll, I'll be using the English Standard Version. Uh, a couple of things. Well, first of all, thank you for that, um, uh, for writing me notes and stuff. I saw those cards back there, and I say to my wife, Stephanie, she's our office administrator. I go, well, what was that for? And she goes, I don't know. <laughs> how, how does she not know? She was very uh, sneaky about it, but I, I do appreciate that. I love being here at this church. I'm so glad that I've been here for 20 years. Um, yes, yeah, so this is kind of fun. It feels like, I don't know, it feels like, have, did you ever do this thing where your class went on a field trip, but for some reason you couldn't go? And so you and just a handful of other kids were in school while they were all gone. You're like, we're not going to get any work done today. That's what I feel like. Half of the church is at camp. And uh, I was there. My wife and I were there. Aaliyah was there as well. We're actually going to head back as soon as we're done um, here because there's some people getting baptized, which is super exciting. And uh, we've been having a great time. And my, matter of fact, my voice is like almost gone from all the... <laughs> a misplaced woo. Uh, but uh, it is, it's a great experience. I mean, there's, you know, families there, singles there, young, old. It's, it's, a, it's great. And so we'll have a, more of a video for you next, next week. But I wanted to do this fun thing, if I could, real quick. I wanted to take a video of you guys saying, good morning, Life Point. We'll see you next Sunday. And I'm going to send it to them because they're in the middle of their service right now so they can play that and see, they can see the rest of their family. Does that sound okay? You down with that? Okay, so I'm going to count to three here. And you're going to say, good morning, Life Point. We'll see you next Sunday. And then woo or something like that. Are you ready? <laughs> good morning, Life Point. We'll see you next Sunday. Woo! Okay. Give me a second while I send that to Pastor Matt. Oh, yeah, that's funny. There's li literally no children in the big room. They're all at, they're all at camp. Okay. Now, now I lost my train of thought, uh, Lyle, and i got to find my things again. Okay. Um, 
This is where, this is where, okay, here we go. Let's get this, send it to Matt Clark. Okay. Okay. I'm going to read from Galatians 5, verses 13 through 15. And if you're willing and able, would you stand as I read this scripture, just to show honor to God's word. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for uh, a wonderful church family. Thank you for all the provisions that you provided this, um, this family. Thank you for a bunch of people at our camp right now that are... Um, meeting new people that are uh, connecting together, um, learning about you and just strengthening relationships inside their own families and inside the body of Christ. And Lord, we just ask that everybody here and those that are watching uh, at home would see this scripture as a, um, as a call to action and an opportunity to serve each other the way Jesus Christ served and continues to serve us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. I found this story uh, on the internet. I found this and I thought it was too good not to share. The title of the story or the title of this news. 47 church splits finally brings doctrinal perfection. Out of Centerville, Georgia, the small community of Centerville has a population of just over 5,000 people. But with a total of 48 Presbyterian churches, they also hold the record for the most number of Presbyterian churches in a small town. The high number of churches has to do with multiple splits that have taken place over the years because of one issue or another. Originally in 1899, only one Presbyterian church existed, simply known as the Centerville Presbyterian Church. With about 20 families, the church was, at that time, the largest in the Centerville area. By 1911, the church had grown to almost 150 members, a considerably large church at that time, but a dispute had arisen within the congregation over whether or not the offering should be taken before or after the sermon. <laughs> Thus, the first split took place with the dissenting congregation forming Centerville Reformed Presbyterian Church. In 1915, a dispute among a, a dispute arose amongst the members of the Centerville Reformed Presbyterian Church, that's the new one, over the issue of regulative principle of worship. It seemed that some members of the CRPC liked the idea of having flowers in the sanctuary, while others did not. As a result, the CRPC split and Trinity Reformed Presbyterian Church of Centerville was organized with 25 members. It, goes on and on a little bit, sort of like this. And then 1975, several more splits have happened with the most recent occurring this past weekend when a dispute arose among the members of 2nd Street, 1st, 9th, Westminster Covenant Reformed Presbyterian Church over the observance of the Lord's Day. The issue in question was whether or not it was acceptable for someone to check their email on the Sabbath. So those who, objected, those who objected have split off and formed the Presbyterian Totally Reformed Covenantal West Ministerian Sabbatarian Regulative Credo Communionist Amillennial Presuppositional Church of Centerville. <laughs> I think we finally got it right now, says Paul Davis, the teaching pastor at PTRCWSRCCAPCC. <laughs> we now have a church of 100% doctrinal purity. <laughs> Thankfully, that is a satire article, but not, not so far from the truth sometimes, am I right? If you've been in church for a while, you might have experienced one of those church splits. And churches split really for one reason, it's legalism. The longer a church exists, the more prone it is to experience legalism. Now, what's legalism? Well, legalism is creating rules and then elevating them 
in the importance so that they're equal or almost equal to the gospel. And in Galatia, that was a big problem. Paul is writing a letter to the Galatian believers, probably a very small church. And that church was struggling with some legalism, mostly over the amount or the kind of foods they ate, over the days that they should worship in special festivals, and over the idea of circumcision. And in that case, and in every case, legalism becomes a hindrance to the gospel. It's like an additional hurdle you have to cross for salvation. Not only do you have to believe in Jesus, but you have to do X, Y, or Z. Legalism is the sign of an unhealthy church. And to be honest, many churches struggle with this around, and you might have experienced it yourself. Paul writes to this Galatian church and offers them a cure, an antidote to legalism, an opportunity for the church to become unified. And if we follow this teaching, it will keep our church strong and it will help us to keep our focus in the right place and to avoid legalism. So I've titled this sermon, The Cure for the Common Church. Let's dive in at verse 13. Paul writes, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Now that's freedom, and, uh, that's brothers and sisters there. You were called to what? Freedom. You were called to what? Freedom. Say it like you're free. You were called to what? Freedom. Freedom. Feels good, doesn't it? Yes. Take a deep breath. Freedom. Not everybody has experienced freedom. Freedom is important. It's so important to me that I, I have it tattooed right on my arm here. People wonder and they ask me, they go, well, what does that word mean? This is the Greek word for freedom. It comes right out of this Bible verse. This Bible verse is so important to me that I tattooed the word freedom on my arm so that I can remember when I look down, I am free. Free how? Free as an American and free in Christ. It's an amazing feeling. Nobody would exchange freedom for slavery. Nobody would exchange their freedom for a set of rules. Look at what the Galatians were doing, though. Look back at verse 1 in chapter 5. It says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Here's what was happening for this church. There were people inside that church that were attempting to bring over some Old Testament laws and add them to the gospel. Like I said, things having to do with the kind of food you ate, things having to do with the certain days that you, that you worshiped, and also this idea of circumcision. Now, circumcision today is not anything that any church would add to their rule list. But, <laughs> but, uh, Let's focus on, on what it is for a second because there are two things that are significant about it and then that will help us understand how it does apply to us. Number one, circumcision is an action taken by a human. It's something you have to do or have done to you. And secondly, it is an outward indicator. Okay? You see what I'm saying? Now, I know that does, it sounds weird now, but in the first century, nudity was not what it is now. So if you were circumcised, you were showing the world, look, this is who I am right? That's an Old Testament law. So what are the things that we might do that are similar adding to the gospel? What action taken by man might we say, oh, you've got to do this. And what actions might we take that say, look at who I am. For some churches, it's maybe the way you dress. For some churches, maybe it's the music that you listen to. For some churches, maybe it's the amount of money that you have to give. You see, what you're saying is like, to, to be a real Christian, you have to do these things in addition to faith, and that is legalism. Remember this, circumcision, as he's talking about, that is an Old Testament rule. It's Old Testament. It's part of the covenant. But Jesus delivered us from the covenant. He delivered us from those rules because they were impossible. Nobody could follow them except for him. So Paul is saying this, if 
you want to follow that Old Testament rule, well, then you're going to you're gonna have to follow all of them. You're going to have to follow all of them. Look at verse 2 in chapter 5. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, meaning you accept some of these rules, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Now, who would do that? Who would exchange freedom for the yoke of slavery? Some people accept that because grace is impossible for them to understand. And that's okay, it should be. Like, it's hard for us to believe, wait, wait, you're saying that for me to have all my sins forgiven, to be part of the family of God, what I've got to do is just place my faith in Jesus Christ? That's all I have to do? Don't I have to do a little bit something else? No. You place your faith in Jesus Christ. That's where salvation comes from. You don't also then have to go to church four times a month. You don't also have to give a certain amount to the church. You don't also have to wear a certain kind of clothing. You don't also have to serve a certain time uh, per year. We want to do those things because it feels good for us to kind of try to contribute. Don't, don't you think that sometimes? Like if you go to your house, somebody invites you to their house for dinner and you arrive and you, what's the first thing you say? What can I do to help? And they say, well, no, no, I, just sit and be comfortable. I, I want to I make this dinner for you. I, I want to give this to you. Oh, I don't like just sitting. I, I need to be of some value. That doesn't work with Christianity. It doesn't work with salvation. Grace is this thing that we get. It's a free thing. We don't do anything to add to it. Now let's go back to verses 13. So he says, you were called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love. What's your Bible say? Serve, Serve one another. Do not use your opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. That word serve is so important. As a matter of fact, it's so important to me that I tattooed my other arm with that word. <laughs> this is the Greek word duolete. It means to be serving. Actually, in many translations, it would be, it would be translated to be a slave. Most Bibles will translate as a servant now because when we, heard, when we hear slavery now, we don't think of what Paul meant by slavery back then. We think of something else having to do with our own American history. But this is to be a servant or a slave of all. He says, look, you weren't given this freedom so that you could do whatever you want with it. You were given this freedom so that you could turn around and give it to somebody else. The payoff of this grace is the freedom to serve others. In a way, you're giving the grace that you received out to the next person. Serving others is a natural byproduct of the grace in your life. If you were to read through Galatians, and I would encourage you to do so, it, it's only six chapters. You could read it in 15 minutes. If you were to read, what you're going to see is this. Paul is essentially dividing people into two sort of camps. On one side, you have this group that's focused on the rules, the legalism, the circumcision. Everything they think about is what they do for the flesh. Everything they think about is what they can achieve through human effort, what they can achieve through the law and serving themselves. But on the other side is everything having to do with the spirit and with the faith we have and with God's power and with the grace and leading to serving other people. One side is about me and what I want and what I get and what I have to gain and how I can boast about it. The other side simply strengthens the body of believers. The other side simply provides grace so that we're a unified body and heading in the same direction. If we're to follow Christ's lead, we must serve each other. Jesus said this himself in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be Served, but to serve. Same word, duolete, to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Look at verse 14, back in Galatians now. He says, don't use this opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We all know that Jesus is the one who said that. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. But do you know where Jesus got that from? He didn't make it up on the spot. It's found in the Bible. It's in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. What is Leviticus in the Bible? It's part of the law. That's mind-blowing. Even in the law, there is grace. It's inescapable. That was God's plan from the very beginning. So here's a test, a litmus test. Do you want to know if you're truly free in Christ? We said freedom. We took a deep breath. Freedom. Do you want to know if you're truly free in Christ? Well, here's the question. Are you serving others or are you serving yourself? Are you serving others or are you serving yourself? If you're only serving yourself, those are signs of legalism. Because if you're only serving yourself, it's as if, it's, it's as if you're trying to gain the freedom or grace by working for it, by adding to it. But if you serve other people, that flows from the natural outpouring of the grace that you've received. Grace creates service for others, not service that creates grace. You see? You don't serve because you achieve something or get something back from God. You serve others because you've already received it from God. Look at verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Consumed by one another. What a strange thing for Paul to say. Watch out if you don't stop biting and devouring one another. Now he's not talking about them actually physically biting. He's drawing on this word picture of, of animal behavior. Right? What do animals do when they're scared, when they're frightened, when they're threatened? They bite. This is, this is Paul saying, you guys, you're acting like animals. Like you don't know better. And if you continue to do this, you will consume each other. That's a, a crazy idea. We used to play this game in college. We were like, um, what would be the worst way to die? Have you ever played this game? Yeah. <laughs> like, would you rather die <laughs> by getting hit by a truck or eaten by a shark? And everybody would say, I, I think everybody would say, I'd rather get hit by a truck. Because how terrible does it sound to be consumed by another living creature? To me, that just feels like the worst thing you can imagine. Or would you rather die by your parachute not opening or by being mauled by a bear? Do you see what I'm saying? Nobody wants to be consumed by another organism, and I think that's what he's getting at. Remember this, animals are intrinsically self-focused. Nobody has to convince my dog to steal food off the table. It's built into his nature. Sometimes after dinner, we'll go into the living room, we'll be watching TV, and it's strangely quiet in the other room, and there's no dog laying with us, and we know he's up on the counter. And he's stealthy about it too, right? You might hear like a little bit of plates, you know, make some noise and you run in there and he looks at you and you know, he's caught. Animals look out for themselves first. They take what they can without excuse. That's in their nature. But here's the thing. As people in our unregenerated state, before we come to Christ, before we give our life to him, we are the same way. Self-absorbed, self-obsessed, self-seeking, self-serving. You don't think so? You don't think people are selfish in their natural state? Have you ever met a baby? <laughs> Did anybody ever have to teach a baby to be selfish? No. Babies and toddlers are naturally selfish. It's a part of their nature. We watched this at the, at the family camp for the last couple of days because there's toys strewn all about and there's little kids everywhere and one of them grabs a little uh, badminton racket and the other one wants the badminton racket and they're going back and forth and then all of a sudden they're squalling and then the parents show up and they solve the problem. But nobody has to teach them to do that. It's part of their nature. Paul's saying, 
this animalistic behavior. If you keep it up, you won't last. You will consume each other. And what happens when the church consumes each other? There's no church left. There's nothing left. Matter of fact, you probably, if you've been a believer for a little while, can think of a situation. Maybe think of a church or somebody that you know where the church doesn't exist anymore. Or it's split into several different churches, each one of them just this sort of small, anemic little representation of the body of Christ. Not the big, beautiful, unified group of people it was, but a few people have just sort of gone off their own way over silly disagreements like whether to have flowers in the sanctuary or whether to take offering before the sermon or after. And it seems kind of silly, but it does happen all the time. If you consume each other, there will be nothing left. Have you ever been to a church like that? Don't lie, I can see the bite marks on some of you guys. <laughs> right? Sometimes the sheep have teeth. You say, well, never, not here at Life Point. Never. Well, we've had our moments, right? We're not perfect. All of us here are still being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We're still learning. We might be tempted to sink our teeth into each other, but here's the good news. There is a cure for all of that. The cure is Jesus. There's a cure for that self-obsessed behavior. There's a cure for that self-absorbed behavior. There's a cure for that self-seeking, self-serving, selfish flesh. It's Jesus Christ. He is the answer. By the way, sometimes no matter what the question is, the answer is Jesus. Have you noticed that? Jesus is the cure for wanting to take out your anger and rage on somebody else. Jesus is the cure for you wanting to bite and devour each other. Jesus is the cure for selfishness. What's our tagline here at LifePoint? What do we say? Our vision is focused on? Christ. Focused on what? Christ. Oh, are you sure it's not focused on rules? Yeah. Focused on the law? No. no. Focused on our building? Focused on money? Focused on the pastor? Focused on the staff? Focused on worship? Programming? Bible studies? Potlucks? Land? Mortgage? Carpet? None of it. Focused on Christ. By the way, not even focused on doctrine, focused on growth, focused on outreach, focused on new people, focused on the building project, focused on the lighting, like all of those things, that doesn't mean they're bad, they're just not our focus. Our focus is on Christ. End of statement, period, exclamation point, focused on Christ. And if we, you and I, the body of believers, if we're focused on Christ, then, are you ready for this? We're focused not on the flesh, but on the spirit. Not on human effort, but on God's power. Not on the law, but on grace. Not on serving ourselves, but on serving each other. Last question. Are you free in Christ today? Then who are you serving? How are you using that freedom to serve someone else? I want you to think for just a moment. Who needs a phone call that you know of that, boy, they, they could use just, just a, a, a comforting word or an encouraging word? Who needs that phone call? Don't wait for somebody else to do it. You do it. Call that person. Text that person. How can you serve that person? Who needs some prayer? Call that person, serve them that way. Who needs a break maybe from their life, from their kids, from their ministry? Who needs a break? Can you serve them and say, let me step in for just a little bit. Let me take some of the weight off. Who needs forgiveness? That's a powerful way to serve somebody. Maybe somebody in your family. Maybe somebody who's a friend, sort of maybe a little bit estranged right now because something happened. You've received the freedom. Now take that freedom and give that to somebody else as a way to serve them. Who can you forgive?
Who needs just simply a kind word, a handshake, maybe even a hug? Who needs to be listened to? You have somebody in your life like that? They just need someone to listen to them. You could be that person. You could serve them that way. Who needs a ride? Somewhere to the store, to the church. There are so many ways to serve each other, but you have to think about it. I'm hoping that God puts somebody on your heart and on your mind right now just, to, just that you can reach out and serve. Remember, grace has freed you, and you're free to serve. If we, through grace, dedicate ourselves to using our freedom to build each other up and serve, then that is the cure for the common church. That's my prayer for us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for all of the good things that you bring into our life, especially freedom. It feels so good to just breathe in this idea that you've given us grace. We don't deserve it. We don't come anywhere close to deserving it. There's nothing that we can do to add to it or to get your favor. You give it to us. Lord, help us to remember to keep you as our focus. And then, Lord, give us opportunities to serve each other somewhere. I just ask that you put on my heart and mind, that you put on our hearts and minds, an individual or maybe a group of people, an opportunity to serve in the way that Jesus served us. And Lord, I ask that it would be a unifying factor for our church and for our community. And in all things, you would receive the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you remain seated while Aaliyah does this next song? free. 
we exalt you this morning we praise you we glorify you because you're worthy father you are worthy Jesus father would we leave this place God changed in freedom would you remind us that we serve you through freedom Jesus we love you so so much Lord in your name we pray amen don't sit down. I just have one quick thing to share with you before we dismiss. Next week, we're having a baptism Sunday. So if you've never been baptized and you would like to be baptized, you can sign up very simply by texting this phone number, 407-988-0911. Now, that's if you want to be baptized or maybe even if you have questions about it. But we already have a few people that are signed up, but there's plenty of room for more. So if you would like to take that next step, in, uh, in your faith journey, please let us know. Until then, God bless you. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next Sunday.